welcome to the Delling Pond with me, James Delling And I really am excited about this week's guest, and I know I always say this. Um, but he's a guy that I've been, I've been sort of getting to know on Twitter, and he's going to tell me more about himself while I, while we have a chat through a kind of, I'm in a slight haze at the moment of, of various drugs. I'm on, I'm on codeine and diazepam and other things because I've just, I've knackered my back and, and I'm in, I'm in enormous pain. So if I, if I sort of drift off, Ronan, Ronan, I'm sure can, can do the heavy lifting because I'm certainly not capable of heavy <laughs> lifting right now. Um, so Ronan, just remind me how to pronounce your, your surname. Ronan, Ronan Maher? No, Mayer. Um, in, in, in Britain, I say, I say Mayer. Um, if I was, if I was Mayer. back back in Ireland um, um, and around my Irish friends and family, I would say Maher. But um, Mayer, well, Mayer's, Ronan, Mayer's good. I have, to, I have to say, to be sure, to be sure, you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't have an Irish accent. You, you've got a Northern accent. I do, I do. Um, I was born in Manchester. Um, 36 oh, years ago okay. and I've lived in Ireland and, um, and, on and off though. And, and, and tell me a bit, a bit about yourself because I have to say I, and I think I think that this is a this is a problem that a lot of older journalists have we see this sort of younger generation of journalists coming up and we, we, we don't really know who they are because because one minute they're kind of kids at school and the second the next second they've got careers and and we probably think of them as a sort of as a sort of threat and uh i don't know what so tell me, tell, just tell me about yourself you're, you're a journalist don't you yeah i mean i'm i'm, I'm just starting out um as a, as a journalist i've written for the critic i've written for hector drummond's website um and i'm i'm writing my first book at the moment before the coronavirus um pandemic i was writing for the local paper um the stockport mail it's a uh, Britain's uh, lesser known paper of record and oh my god that's that's very old school that that that, that starting out on a local newspaper yeah. is, is 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 I mean that used to be the the route into journalism for most people um but I didn't realize it still happened what so what was it like working on a local newspaper um it was it gave me the chance to reach a lot more people than um than than you otherwise might expect about 90,000 people um, which isn't isn't too bad. Ninety thousand a week now. I mean, I know it's not um, anything like a national yeah. paper, but it, it, gave, it gave me a chance to um, get around talking to people in the community um, and dealing with issues on a very you know on a local level. And um, you know, it's quite a long way from thinking about you know, the U.S. election and um, international issues and so forth. So I mean, it's a bit more palpable, really. Um, I feel like I, you know can have more of an effect. But, yeah, but but also, I mean, look. I, I think that one of the rationales behind that that old old learning the trade was that you had to do proper stuff like doorstepping people, um, sort of writing about stuff that you really might not want to write about, like people who'd been recently bereaved or cover. I mean, was that the sort of thing you were doing as well? Or yeah, I mean, last last um, um, piece I wrote was something called the what I call the food bank archipelago. Um, and this is uh, uh, happening all across the Western world, where they said that a food bank archipelago has grown out across the West, um, and that it basically it's a it's a huge um, bureaucracy of um, um, people who are making a fortune out of out of food banks. Really, um, you know, it's the it's the food really food poverty industry, um, and we've got we've got six of six food banks here in in Stockport alone. And I argued that they're, they're not going to go away and it's nothing to do with poverty, really. Um, because once you wean people onto um, free stuff, it's quite difficult to wean them off it. Yeah, well, quite. I mean, if you build it, they will come. What, who, who would not turn down free food? Of course, this is it. You know, I mean, I remember when um, um, Domino's, Domino's offered free pizza one day, um, free slice of pizza, <laughs> and there was a, there was, there was a queue um, all the way down the road. Obviously, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a huge difference yeah. in, in behaviour between um, zero for free um, and, and even ten pence. Um, it, you know, prices do, do affect behaviour. It's a it's a it's a fact which people ignore too much. Well, look, you're obviously a, a, a bright thinking thinking person, but 
as as you say, it, it ought it ought not to be beyond the wit of most even halfway intelligent people. And I, I suppose if, if you, that should be the entry level requirement for journalists of being half halfway intelligent, sure, you would have thought that they would they would see this straight away. And yet it's amazing how how the left uses the argument about look we have x number of food banks and the fact that we have so many food banks means that poverty is a serious problem in in britain um how did your argument how did your piece go down when you made this case that perhaps well this was a kind of an industry of scam um it went down well i was a little bit nervous um putting that out because it's one of those things which um, you know, it's one of those subjects which you're supposed to stay away from, isn't it? You know, you're supposed to only view it in, in, in one way, and that is to say, through the prism of the left. Um, it, 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 was, it was okay. It was a bit difficult because my, my girlfriend's family um, are, are quite on the left, so I was concerned about that, especially as, as her, her mum actually works with, with food banks. Um, so I was a bit right. concerned about what they would think because, you know, you don't want to... Um, you don't want to... Offend the, the offend the in-laws, you know. This is it. I mean, no, they they don't. they don't they don't actually know the full the full horror of my um my political views. So they're not well. Luckily, they're never going to find it because they're not going to listen to this podcast. I mean, I I I, <laughs> I, 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 I doubt it. Unfortunately, they should do. No. Um, your podcast only, is great. I'm afraid only drooling right wing loons listen to me. Um, tin, this is pure. I've I, I, I've captured the market. You know, me and David Icke. Yes. Um, are you, you going to get David Icke on? I've captured. I, I'd love to get David Icke on. I, I mean, I'm I'm in, I'm intrigued by him. He's he's he talks a lot of sense on some things. I don't think on everything. I mean, I don't I don't I don't kind of share his views. The lizard master race. Jews, for example. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I he's not he's not very. I mean, I'm I'm kind of fellow Semitic, and I don't, I'm not sure that he is altogether. Yeah. Um, is, 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 it, lots to, lots to... is it that um, um, lizards is a is a, a mask for for Jews, or does he actually mean lizards? I mean, really well, that would mean be, that would that would be the interesting thing to find out. I think the challenge of of, of doing David I, you know, people often say to me, "Why don't you do podcasts with more left wing people?" You know, then it would stop being an echo chamber, which is a, is a phrase I absolutely hate. All I'm interested in is in interesting conversations, intelligent conversations. And the two alleys I wouldn't want to go down are one, the kind of Marxist dialectic in people in which people like Owen Jones and Ash Sarkar specialize. I mean, you couldn't, you could, it, it, it wouldn't really be a conversation because their, their view of what is is so different from my view of what is. And it's not a question of, of I mean, it's a question of Marxist dialectic is, 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 is a sort of parallel logic. It's got nothing to do with the world we inhabit. And I can't, I can't see anything, anything fruitful in, in having a conversation with such people. Um, in the same way, I'm not sure I'd be wanting to spend 20 minutes sort of cringing while somebody expounded on why the Jews or the lizard-headed people were responsible, you know, how the Rothschilds were taking over the world. I mean, yeah. I, you know, don't get me wrong. I do believe that there are conspiracies going on. I just don't really feel threatened by, by the Jews or, or the lizard-headed master race. And I kind of think that would be a waste of podcast time. Yeah. I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, it's a it's a wicked thing the the anti-Semitic virus, um, and it's it's still all around us, especially in the Labour Party, it's, but, it's, but not exclusively. I mean, it's it's curious, isn't it? Because I I, I kind of think that um, it's a bit like with women, actually. You know, I do think I do think women are, are are in many ways the superior species, and they can do loads of really good shit. You know, they're they they they're, they're there for us in so many ways. I mean, without them, we'd be lost. Wouldn't we? We, I couldn't agree more. Uh, at, the, at the same time, they can they can do really really annoying shit, which is just defies rationalism, and you can see why people could become misogynist. And in the same way, w w I suppose with Jews, the problem is that they're fantastic. I mean, they're just like they're like superheroes. They've got they're they're they're, they're so clever. You know, they punch above the weight with with um with nuclear with uh, 
with Nobel Prizes and and I love them and I love you know I've got lots of Jewish friends. At the same time, the, it cannot be denied that many of the world's worst Marxist philosophers are Jews. So you can see you can see why if you wanted to be anti-Semitic, you could you could uh, you could focus on people like um, uh, Saul Alinsky and. Was, was Karl Marx Jewish? I don't know. Was he? Karl Marx was, yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah. So, so you, so you, so you, so you, you, you but anyway, <laughs> that's that's by the by. Um, so, local newspaper. Um, you then, I mean, I have to say, you poor sod. How old are you? I'm thirty six. Yeah, you're thirty six. I mean, you know, I think mine. I, I'm fifty four. I think mine was the last generation, um, which saw journalism when it was still a still a trade worth being part of i mean you know the first half of my career i could i could lead a comfortable middle class lifestyle on a journalist salary which you definitely can't now yeah i mean you know you're 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 in it for the purely for the love whereas i could get it a bit of the money as well does that bother you um it it does um i'm I'm studying law um, part time, oh, part time at night, so I have yep. a, I have a backup. Um, I originally studied English and uh, English language and English literature, the same as as you. Um, but oh, yeah. it was it was at Leeds University, and it was a horror story. Um, I mean, the first week I arrived, was it, was I was it told that I should read the Guardian, for instance. Um, it was, it wasn't. It was. I mean, it was it was critical theory. Um, every Every oh, that's terrible! Day, practically, um, Marxist uh, drivel, mumble jumbo, mumble jumbo shoved down my throat. Um, I hated it with a, with, a, with a passion, and I love it. I love English. That's I awful. Love, I love I love literature. So it was um, it was it was hurtful in in ways. Um, it was extremely um, um, irritating too because I moved over from Ireland, um, especially to to study at Leeds, and I arrived there and found mm. it was uh, like a Maoist re-education camp. Um, uh, did so. you did you have any kind of indications beforehand that that the course was going to be theory dominated? No, but um, I mean, now looking back, knowing what I know now, I I would have I would have I wouldn't have gone on the course. Absolutely not. But at the time, it wasn't obvious to me because I didn't know what critical theory was. You know, when someone says no. critical theory, well, surely that's just um, you know critical reasoning, how 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 to look at things critically. That's a good thing, surely, but um, it, it's not that. It's it's Marxist. Um, attack everything in the West, yeah. try and pull it down, um, and do it through do it through um, the prism of of literature, um, destroying books like um, um, Heart of Darkness, for for example, um, where everything is is seen as um, as a patriarchal. Um, oppressive, racist, misogynist, racist. Yeah, of yeah. course, racist. Yeah, misogynist. Yeah, yeah. ignoring absolutely. ignoring that, that Conrad it's... was a was a, was a was a truly great novelist, um, writing in his second language, of course. Too, that didn't matter to them really very much. It sort of it, didn't it seem that way anyway. It it reminds me a bit of a, there's a piece I read yesterday, I think, um, in the Guardian of all places, where a an art critic was talking about how people who've read history of art no longer have the capacity to be able to differentiate between quite similar artists because they haven't been taught about that aspect of art. They haven't been taught about painting techniques or, 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 or styles or, or or schools or whatever that they're more in, interested in the kind of the social aspects of the world that produce the art and the kind of you know the phallocentric you know the i suppose the fact that women women are outnumbered by men and this 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 is i mean it is cultural marxism has infected i think most of the most of the liberal arts and so that part of me understands why why people sing the praises of STEM subjects and 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 are down on the arts? So I think that's a mistake. I think that there are pockets. I mean, my my, my kids are both studying English at Durham, and although there is one compulsory critical theory paper, um, 
which my son certainly massively ripped the piss out of. You know, he just kind of, he, <laughs> you know, he said the things that they wanted to, they wanted to hear him say, but at the same time, completely ripped apart Marxism and double. Uh, but what I'm saying is that you still can study the joy of literature, and I'm I'm very sorry that you, who obviously love literature, have never had a chance to spend three years reading lots of books and sort of explaining for, or finding thoughts to express why they're great which is i i think why you should study yeah study yeah. literature do do you think um that the taxpayer should pay for it though that's that's an interesting yeah i to a degree i i'm gonna sound elitist here but i don't think elitism is a dirty word sure I really think that the idea that there ought to be a kind of cultured elite is a good one. I, I, I do think it's very, very important that a percentage of the population of a civilized country is familiar, as the educated classes once were, with art, with literature, with history, that they're probably able to speak at least one language. That they're, you know, they're familiar with 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 the sciences as well. I mean, I, you know, the, the um, I, I don't think you should be totally scientifically ignorant. Uh, uh, to be familiar with Latin phrases and the odd Greek phrase and so on. Maybe have done a bit of Latin. I think that's a good thing. I think you do you do need something for the rest of the population, aspirational people at least, to want to become part of you know i mean opera i'm not an opera fan but i like the idea that opera's there uh, you know wagner i'm hoping that one day maybe i'm when i'm 60 or 70 i'll suddenly want to go to bayreuth and listen to the ring cycle and i'll realize that it's not boring it's just a bloody amazing thing and i like the idea that classical music is being performed to the to the highest level um or it ought to be rather than recruiting orchestras on the basis of, of, of skin color, which seems to be the new fashion. Um, yeah. So what I'm saying is going back, I think Tony Blair utterly destroyed um, education, university education in this country by, by imposing this 50% quota, when in fact, I think probably only 10% or 15% of the population is really suited to, to that, to, to that level of education. I think most people should be going on from school and having an apprenticeship or something actually useful where they can earn, earn a good living. Um, so I wouldn't have any objection to, you know, my generation of course got a free education courtesy of the taxpayer. I'm not sure that's such a terrible thing. I mean, you know, I can see the counter arguments. It's not something that I, I would, it's not a hill I want to die on. Um, I, but again, to answer your question, I don't, I think the fetishization of, of, of STEM subjects is a, a mistake because what it, what it ignores is two things. One, people who've done sciences can be just as incredibly ineffably stupid as, as people who've done, done liberal arts subjects. You only have to look at the field of environmental sciences, for example. Um, and, and the second thing is that what the arts, what the, what the sciences don't teach you is critical thinking and actually critical thinking, I think is just as important as the, just as important a contributor to culture as, as being good at maths and, and, and sciences and stuff. Yeah. Um, where are you on that one? I, I Do you agree or am I wrong? I think that, um, I mean, Gavin Williamson just um, um, torpedoed the 50% 50, 50 target, um, which is yeah. one of the only good things um, to come out of this government. Um, he's also said that universities um, will have to support free speech if they're going to get funds going forward to help with, with the coronavirus pandemic effects. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's a, a, a very good thing. Both, I mean, both, of, those, both of those moves are very good. Um, I do think that people should um, be going to university a lot far less um, and studying things um, other than just the stems 
Um, I do see the other side of the coin, though. Uh, someone might argue, well, yeah. why why should I? Um, why should my taxes? Why should the taxes of of someone who only earns you know twenty k a year um, go to to paying for people to go and study literature for three years? Um, I see I see what they're um, what they're saying, but you know I I broadly agree with you. We do need to have an elite. We do need to have. I, mean, I think I think inequality is a fact of life, and I think it's a good thing, and we should be able to look up. I like looking up to. Um, experienced writers for example and um you know aspiring to to reach their their levels um i think if everyone's done down to the same level nothing ever improves and it'll just start slowly go down even further yeah i think um who was it who, who said greed is good um in um Ayn Rand. no no we have great um, <laughs> yeah Ayn Rand said it, but who else said greed is good? Um, uh, Gordon Gecko said it in Wall Street. But I also think that um, I mean, obviously, greed is good. I mean, it's it's a it's a motiva- motivating force. Um, in the same way, I think inequality is good for for, for much the same reasons that in- inequality means that you you look at where you are and you think, well, I, I'm not sure I want to be where I am. I want I want something more than that, and it something gives you something to. It, it, aspire to and something to yearn to provide for your children to have a give them a better life than you had i think that these are very powerful things and that's 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 good i also think that one of the things that's missing about the the debate about in inequality is that it's not just about it's not just about wealth is it it's about all manner of things that the state could never micromanage to the point where we were all equal. You know, looks, for example, um, penis size, um, charisma, sporting sporting skills, even things like, you know, okay, so I'm I'm I was born probably into the upper middle middle classes, but what what I what I my disadvantage is that I haven't got the kind of the the credibility that working police, the working class people have, you know, I mean, if I wanted to be a pop star, uh, I would be at a considerable disadvantage to somebody who, who could claim to be from, well, from Manchester, say, from, you know, from urban Manchester, that would be, a, that would be a far better, I mean, all I, the best hope for me as a pop star would be fucking Coldplay, wouldn't it? Yeah. Whereas <laughs> if I was, if I were, you know, I could, if I were from Manchester, I could be, I, I could have been Morrissey or Johnny Marr, yeah. <laughs> which is way cooler. So, so it, it's just, I don't know. I, I think people should stop whinging and just, I, I was thinking about this today, actually. I was thinking about, about what was it? Uh, people, people of, of, of mixed race who, who seize on the black half of their, of their parentage and use that as a kind of way of, 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 of showing that they're, you know, to improve their position in the hierarchy of, of, of victimhood. And I was thinking, I was looking at my parents and I was thinking, they're just my parents. But imagine if your parents weren't just your parents, but they suddenly became a vital tool in enabling you to find a better place in the hierarchy of victimhood. What's, what's all that about? It's just, it's just crazy that we let these people get away with that shit. Yeah, it's 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 appalling, isn't it? Leveraging your um, your parents uh, to 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 climb up the, uh, the hierarchy of of, uh, of all this mad identity politics is it's wrong. I, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I could do it. Um, but to, to, with the NHS. Both my parents you? are um, NHS nurses. And they're retired now. Oh, um, but my, go- oh, my well girlfriend's done. NHS. Hey, so. <laughs> I could cl- I could I could cloak myself in that and um and probably going yeah, right, right for the Guardian or something, but. I have no desire to do it. Did, did you did you go through a phase where um, you did you go through a left wing phase? Yeah, I started out on the left. I was a Guardian reader, um, even even occasionally the Morning Star. Um, I was very much on the left until it was Islam, which which turned me actually, as it happens. Um, I couldn't square. Um, um, defending this 
what I see as a very dangerous ideology. I know that's not something you're supposed to say these days. I mean, you've had Tommy Robinson on your podcast um, several times, so you know all about this stuff. But yeah, uh, the way they treat women, Jews, um, gays, uh, I just I found it absolutely appalling, and I couldn't understand why it was being defended by people on the left. Um, and I think I was reading a lot of Christopher Hitchens, who obviously was a man on the left too, um, and that kind of mm. pulled me pulled me away. Um, I mean, I, I, as it happens, I think Christopher Hitchens remained on the left all of his life. But um, anyway, I yeah, I, I'm, I moved I moved away because of Islam, and then everything else kind of started coming down to you know, the idea that you should have um, high taxes and became became obviously absurd to me um, because it constricts the society and stops people from um, starting businesses, stops people from expanding businesses. Um, you end up with a huge, great big state. When you've got a huge, great big state, everything com- everything becomes about politics. And I find politics fascinating, but um, I don't like that it is everywhere now. And everything's politicised. And I think that's because of the size of the state. You know, and, and a, a whole host of other things just... I don't know. Do I have any left-wing opinions now? I don't know. I'm not sure. They've all they've all kind of they've all kind of gone. You know. It well it depends, I suppose, what how you define left-wing. I mean, I, yeah. I, I I'm just racking my brain to think of what left-wing opinions I hold. I mean, for example, I don't think we should have bailed out the banks in 2008. I that, think that's arguably a right-wing opinion, though, isn't it? Well, you see, that's the thing. You see, oh, but 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 Occupy, who are about as left as they come, I think are always whining on about how we, we bailed out the banks. So it's interesting. There's a kind of nexus there, isn't there, where between us kind of Hayekian, sort of von Mises kind of classical liberals and, and the really hard left. And I suppose, again, I'd be, I'd be with George Soros on drugs legalization um i mean i can see the harm that they do but i you know this is where i differ from peter hitchens i just think that we we seek altered states and i'm sure we have done since monkeys drank fermented whatever you know (laughs) and got and got off their faces on fermented berries or or something it's just yeah, drinking it's just reindeer what piss. We like to do drinking what? Sorry, reindeer piss. Yeah, yeah. Well, re- drinking. Very good point. Drinking, drinking reindeer piss. I, I think partly it's a function of the fact that I'm not. I, I don't know whether you found this with your circle of friends. Some people lend themselves readily to alcohol and can handle it, and some people are much better off with the weed. Yeah. Um, I happen to, my body just doesn't really like alcohol that much, unless it's very, very good sort of Grand Cru, Grand Cru Claret or whatever. Um, you know, it's about the only only wine I drink and I, I like a gin, but generally I'm much, you know, between a, and a cocktail I like, because cocktails are like drugs, but generally I think I much prefer the weed to, um, to, to, to booze. And I, I think it's unfair that we have a system which discriminates against the weed smokers. Yeah, I mean, so I'm on, I'm on the fence about opinion. this one. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, a, I'm on the fence about this. I'm somewhere between you and Peter Hitchens. I used to be um, right. very much um, with, with you on this, legalise everything, let people make their minds up for themselves. And I, yeah. I would always you know, look at alcohol and say, well, why, why is that legal and why is weed not? I used to smoke quite a lot of weed. I don't, I don't anymore. Um, mm-hmm. I find it very demotivating. That said, I, I do like listening to music while I'm stoned. I like reading while I'm stoned, I like writing when I'm stoned. Um, but it is it is it is demotivating for me. It's it's not obvious to me that if we were to legalize um, weed tomorrow in Britain, that it would it would be a good thing. It's not obvious to me that it wouldn't end in in um, in disaster. I mean, my girlfriend is a psychiatrist, and she deals with um, people who've who've got. I mean, marijuana-induced psychosis. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. All the time, um, and these people are, are are a mess. Now, I I, I know I know the, the pro legalization side of the argument will say that um, um, there are other confounding factors, and that 
the weed, it wasn't the weed. The weed is incidental. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced. There does seem to be um, a lot of evidence that um, it's maybe not for everybody, but for some people, it's it's, it's bad. And if it's oh no, totally. I I don't think you even need to argue with that. I I think it's a given. I think I think lots of people are being made psychotic by by the weed and people who smoke too much of it and stuff. But the thing is, I, I'm not sure that that. <laughs> that legalization would make these people smoke any more than they do anyway. I think they're probably already smoking to the max. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think you're going to housing estates and things and finding people are thinking, well, I would get off my face on weed if it were legal, but the fact that it isn't illegal is making me think twice. It's, you know, it's there. So why, why waste the criminal justice system on pers- you know, prosecuting and persecuting people who are going to do this thing regardless a bit like it's a bit like prohibition i mean you you could cause, cause the, you could make the same argument about about booze couldn't you i i know loads of people whose, whose lives have been ruined quite quite ruined by you know they are just husks promising people who have just been wrecked by alcohol yeah and not to mention the sort of violence and car accidents so i, I don't know that, that that would be my rationale it's not you know I, it, it's certainly not that the, the weed is harmless rationale it's more that like prohibition it doesn't work yeah i think didn't, didn't more people um drink during prohibition than before didn't it virtually promote drinking in some ways is that right yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm almost sure sure of that yeah, I, mean, I I don't know. I'm on the fence. I I I want to to say I agree, um, and I'm almost there. But I'm, there's a niggling doubt there that it would end well. I I think that if it was available, um, um you know, on the high street, what's what's left of the high street, um, supermarkets, yeah, or, uh, you know, I, I I think more people um, who would not um, have otherwise smoked would start smoking, and that. They might. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We have to, but it would see. revive. It's not happen but, anyway. but just given you, you, it could revive the high street, Renan. And that, <laughs> my God, my God, how much? How much do the high streets need? I mean, what's 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 happening to our country? I mean, how bizarre is if look if you'd written a dystopian novel in even in 1919. And you'd called it 2020 and you'd outlined the stuff that's happened this year. You, yeah, it would just be, I don't know. Uh, it, would anyone believe it? I, I, I think, think fiction so. is dead. I think fiction is dead. I, I, I don't know how, how, um, how you can beat this um, by making it up. You know, you, you, people would have said you were mad if you said this two years ago. If you said, mm. said in two years time, um, our great cities will be hollowed out, Depop- depopulated um, yeah. of, of everyone, not just of people f- fleeing from the effects of, of left wing policies. Um, yeah. And yeah, because you, 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 you've gone the city of London, well, at least the city of London, that's never going to get kind of empty because like finance, it's the beating beating heart of our economy and bankers work really hard. They're never not going to turn up to the office. And yet, and yet, um, Carry it's, on. it's it's happened. Um, you know, if, happened. if if you said that that, that we would be um, instructed to um, stay at home, in other words, put put under de facto house arrest by, by the government, yeah, um, for a, for a, a disease which is um, no more dangerous than the flu, and even less dangerous than the yeah. flu um, by orders of magnitude for very young people, and, and that and that most of us would would um, comply willingly and um, ridicule those who. Um, 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 say that it's wrong and that it's damaging. Um, they would have said you you were mad. They would. They would have said you are a mad person. Um, you know, they'd, they'd have yeah. categorised you along. You know, with, with David Icke. They would. I, I, I mean, I think I think we ought, we ought to um, nail this this um, issue with the flu. I mean, I, I don't think any either of us certainly is saying. That the flu is not a bad thing. I don't, I don't know how many times in your life you've had the flu. I've had it about maybe two or three times, something like that. And it's been nasty, you know. It knocks you sideways, doesn't it? And you're in bed, and you're aching. And 
I know that flu's flu's a killer. It, yeah. it can yeah. be if you're if you're old or you're vulnerable. Um, but yet, if you get the flu, okay, your mum knows about it, and your maybe your two or three, you know, your work might know about it if you take time off work. But that's it. Whereas if you get the coronavirus, which actually in my experience is not as bad as the flu, I had it for five days and I carried on working through it. And all it did was I, I remember thinking, God, this is shit. God, I feel rotten. And I carried on working. And why am I thinking so slowly? I hate the fact that I'm, I can't bash my piece out as quickly as I can. And, and then I went to bed and, and I was drenching my t-shirt in sweat. And I thought to myself, this is good because a fever is, is your body's way of, of getting rid of the disease. But that, that was my COVID experience. But it, but it wasn't like flu where you're thinking, I can't move. I can't, I can't do anything. I just feel. Um, so flu is bad and coronavirus can be bad, but, but that's, that's it. It's not, it's not an order of magnitude worse. In fact, it's, as you, you say, it's actually not as bad as the flu. And yet if anyone gets the coronavirus, we know about it and we've heard their anecdotes we've heard how bad it is but you wouldn't get the same with the flu just because we accept that the flu is a thing that happens yeah um i mean we've had winters where sixty thousand people have died from the flu flu's flu's no no joke. 17 2017 2018 i believe was yeah. was one of those the excess winter deaths i think were sixty thousand, which is more than we've had in 2020 of coronavirus exactly um, now, of course, the the pro lockdowners, uh, the bed, bedwetters, would um, yeah would argue that if it were not for the lockdown, um, it would have been far worse. But you know they have to they have to explain why why that didn't happen in Sweden, for example. You know, um, yeah. It's, well, it's they mad. also have to. Ha- well, the peak the the the, the peak I think um, happened. Before the lockdown, didn't it? Actually, the lockdown. The, the peak. They, peak of deaths was April seventh. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know uh, when. When did March twenty third did the lockdown start? So the peak, the deaths. Right. Well, in, in 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 which in which case it was in it was in decline before before lockdown. Because you can't claim yeah. that the lockdown is what is what um, is what did it. Although many, many are, even, the, even people who otherwise um, um, are very intelligent. I think, for example, Rod Little, extremely surprised that Rod Little oh, yes. has, um, has, has uh, uh, bought this um, because, you know, I, I regarded Rod as um, one of Britain's best columnists, you know, and he's just going to have to deal Well, he is. He is. On, on, his, on, on his day, Rod is unbeatable, but on, not on his day he can be quite, you know, a bit, a bit disappointing in the same way. I, I really don't like slagging off my, my mates cause I'm very fond of Rod and I'm very fond of, of Douglas, but there was, there was a very well-made point in a letter that Peter Hitchens wrote to um, the spectator. I don't know whether you saw it. I didn't. Douglas, Douglas wrote a piece saying, well, you know, I really don't know what to think about the coronavirus and the, and the, and the policy, but I'm glad, I'm glad that um, people like Peter Hitchens are out there with their contrarian voices. And Peter Hitchens wrote back to the effect that I have been vilified for my opinions on the coronavirus, for, for saying unpopular things. And... I'm glad that Douglas thinks that it's nice that I that I'm that I'm expressing my freedom of speech, but actually it's rather more important than that. And this is not one of those issues where you can sit on the fence where and say, "Well, I really don't know," because actually, you, one is perfectly capable. Any intelligent person, you don't need to be a virologist, you don't need to be an epidemiologist, or any scientist of any kind to look at the charts, to look at the evidence, to, 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 to look at the range of scientific views in which are being expressed and they're available because of this wonderful thing we have called the internet. We can see this stuff and you can form an intelligent view and you can form the view that what we're being told by the government is not, is not accurate. Uh, so w- tell, tell me about your, your, your journey on this. Cause you've been, you've been, I mean, like me, you've been pretty, um, forthright in your skepticism but when when did you sort of 
when did it click with you um i i started out very worried um you know i, I saw what was happening in in italy in from from a distance obviously yeah. bodies piling up um yeah. i saw what was going on in in china and welding people into yeah. apartments and all the rest of it and yeah um, you see, you you like like me you'd seen the stuff on on sort of the back channels on Twitter and stuff, and you've been following this stuff and you're thinking, yeah, people being welded into their buildings yeah. and the stories about the mysterious um, composition of the pyres that have been spotted by satellite, you know, yeah. of, of clearly biological, way, you know, basically humans being burned. Yeah. You yeah. saw all that and yeah. Um, and I, I, I heard that um, huge numbers of, of um, urns were being ordered by um, funeral homes in China and um, you know and I saw that, that the flights were continuing that our borders were still effectively wide open uh, nothing was being done yeah. and I have older um, my, my dad's not in great health my mum's got health problems too um, you know I've yeah. got other family members who are who, who, who are older and I'm not in great shape you know I yeah. wasn't worried so much for myself because um, I figured yeah. that it was highly unlikely that it was going to be um, something that's going to hurt hurt me badly. I mean, I I agree with what you said earlier in the conversation about the flu. Flu is no no joke. You don't want to get it. I think I've had it I've had it once, um, and it not not me sideways. Um, I expected something something like that was coming coming our way, but I mean, I I was worried about my parents. I got on the phone to them. Um, you got to take this seriously. You've got to um, stay at home. Um, and yeah, about over the next couple of weeks, um, I. I started to um, realize that maybe, maybe it's not quite, quite that bad, really. And I was um, reading Dr. Michael Levitt's work and uh, John Yunardis, um, Professor uh, yeah. John Yunardis at both of them at Stanford University. Um, and I like I like Stanford. I like especially the Hoover Institute. I think they've got um, a lot of the, the 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 best. They've got Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell, yeah. Um, who 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 I, I'm a big fan of. I love, I love Thomas Sowell. He's my, he's, he's my, he's my, he's my god. <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's the man, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Love him. Oh, I love that book. I love that book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I try, yeah. I try to get, I try to get friends to to read that, and they all they see is basic economics. Why would I want to read a book about economics? I know it's fantastic. It's even beautifully written too. You know. Anyway, um, I, I listening to, to to those guys in the United States and um and so suddenly it started to look not that not that not that bad you know and I remember that fateful mm. weekend where um Boris moved from um on the Thursday he was he was um saying we we need to isolate ourselves if we're sick um and then by Monday he was locking the country down after the media went mental um, um, in response to the Pre Professor Ferguson Doomsday Report, um, and it, by then I was, by then I was fully, fully against it. Um, I was, I was arguing that um, anyone, anyone who who says that the army should be out on the streets against the British people was 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 quite mad, um, and that that we needed to we needed to re um, protect our liberty. Um, I, I believe. I believe that um, it's now under great threat. And I was right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so and and where? By the way, do you, are you are you in London or in Manchester? I mean, I'm in Manchester. I'm just outside of Manchester. Yeah, Manchester. Yeah. Well, your your sort of friendship friendship group. Um, where where are they on all this? Uh, there's a mix. I know. I I, I do. I do have friends who um, are. I love them dearly, extremely bright people. Um, but they they think that the lockdown was the right thing to do. Um, and they, beyond beyond just thinking that it was the right thing to do at the time with the information that we had then, they think it was effective. Um, they think that it was it was it was the right thing to do, even um, in hindsight. And that that boggles my mind a bit. Um, but then I've got I've got other friends who um, are right there with me and think it's it's crazy. Um, my parents, um, my my mum's a bit on the fence. My dad's fully he, he listens to your podcast. Um, 
he's he's right there right there with us um he goes right. he's been going out for quite a while um, he doesn't consider it to be a threat to him at all yeah it's yeah. it's, it's um, my dad's quite quite militant as well he's, he's mil- 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 militantly uh, he he's he's a skeptic yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. You know, he's, I mean, he's, you know, he's, he'd, he'd, he'd be happy to die for the, for the principle of, of, um, <laughs> of his freedom to go out. Yeah, yeah. He's been, because he had, he had heart surgery um, late last year, and he got a message saying, you know, a, a printed form saying, you know, if you've had this surgery, you need to take exercise and you need to get back working. So when they closed the car parks on the Malvern Hills where he used to walk, he would find somewhere, you know, in a private road and park there and defy the police. And, you know, he, he wasn't having it at all. I'm very, very proud of him. He, he, he claims that I've sort of radicalised him, but I, I, I think he's, I think, I think Dellingpoles actually all have a very bloody-minded streak because my mother's the same. They just, we just don't take any shit. I don't know why. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that aspect of evolutionary biology, what it is that, that predisposes some of us. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be an education thing. You know, you can have had the same education and everything, same social background, but you can reach completely different conclusions. And it seems to me to be the way that our brains will, you haven't got kids, I imagine, have you? Not yet, no. No. It, it, it's weird. I, I, I think a lot of it is nature. And I think a lot, I, I think we, we, we create these almost fully formed beings. I mean, obviously you can help them become more rounded, more polite, more intelligent, more whatever. But I think generally people's politics are actually hardwired into them. That's, that, that's um, interesting. I've, 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 I've not, I've, I've not heard that before. Um, I think that our personalities are, um, um, inherited not entirely of course but i do think they are largely yeah. inherited I don't, I don't buy into the blank st- blank slate theory or any of any of that nonsense um i think we 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 inherit we inherit traits are you are you are you arguing that that um our politics is shaped by by those traits or do you what do you, what do you mean when you say we they're hard wired. well you see it's interesting inter- interesting what what i what i've what i've read about about this is that People say that actually, as a parent, you don't really have much influence on your children's um, development beyond a certain point, their their personalities and their politics and stuff, that peer group pressure has a much more important role to play, which is which is quite interesting. But I mean, what do I know? I've, I've only been observing this from the experiment of my own children. How, how, how old are your children, me- James? Well, you see, I've got three. I've got a grown-up one who's not—he's not—he's my stepson, but he's like mine. He's—I've like, had him since he was six, so he's—you know—he's my my boy, and I think of him as my boy. Um, and he shares my politics, um, so so that would go against you know that 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 does sound like a nurture argument. But then I look at my two, you know, the other the other two, and um, they're really—they they try and fight it. You know, daughter tries to be a feminist because you know that's what girls are like when they're when they're teenagers. You know, I'm not a feminist, definitely not. But I just I just get from my observations that, that so much of the, of the their velt and shower, as it were, is is really just like it's it's hardwired into them. You know that they're they're not going to turn out to be left arts. <laughs> they're just not. I hope. You, 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 you hope. What, what would you, what would you rather they be, um, left-hearted or Scientologists? Oh, I don't know. Science, that would be weird. That would be weird if they were Scientologists. Um, I don't know. Um, I, do you know what? I think, I, I think actually, and you'll find this when you become a parent, that you just want them to be happy, yeah. Really, you just want them to 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 be f- happy and fulfilled, and you have to accept that if they turn out to be gay, or or um, Christian, or or left wing, or whatever, you've just got to kind of love them for who they are. Are you are you religious? 
Um, I, to a degree, I, when they were younger, I took them to church and I thought it was a very important part of their upbringing that this is their, this is their culture. I, I, I talked to, a bit about this to, um, to Nick Timothy, um, I had on the podcast the other day. I used to enjoy going to church. I, I think it's really important that every British child should be aware of the Christian tradition of their culture. They should know the Bible stories backwards because this is their culture. And whether they like it or not, whether they want to go and go to church later on, that for 2000 years, nearly every, every British person, well, I mean, obviously and, and we didn't have the Christian evangelists coming to England immediately after Christ, but whenever it was that the first Christian evangelist came to, came to, to Britain, um, from that point on, British people were versed in Christian culture, Christian tradition. Um, and that to reject that would be like rejecting, I don't know. I mean, um, well, I'm not going to say Morris dancing, but, but, you know, think of something that's really important and really English. That's sort of one of our defining characteristics. I think it's really important. I, we, we, it's very unhealthy if we do, if we deracinate it. I, 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 I think that this is where I don't like the kind of globalist vision of people like George Soros, the idea that we should all just be this homogenous mass. I think it's really good that when you go to Germany, I went to Germany, I spent a, three weeks living in Germany in Frankfurt and I had a, such a happy time there. Um, just, just immersing myself in German culture and you know, a bit of the language. And um, I went out one night to this, to this bar with this German. And while we were having dinner, this man came in in this strange outfit with, they, it wasn't lederhosen, but it was a sort of weird, it was a weird um, traditional outfit. And it turned out that he was some kind of journeyman training to be, I don't know, a carpenter or something like that. And there is in Germany this tradition where, where, where they, they wear these outfits and you, you recognize them by their outfits and they wander around and you give them you, you, you give them your charity, you buy them drinks and you get them board and lodging and you give them work and they work their way around the country, developing their skills. And I thought, that, that's, isn't that a fantastic German tradition? And how, how could you not love that? And, and how could you not want that continue, to continue forever? There are things the French do, which are uniquely French. I remember I was just going to, when I was last in Paris and seeing these 14 year old girls smoking, smoking in kind of doorways and things, you know, just like both uh, we smoke because it's what we do because we are French. And I think, yeah, go French, stay French. And we, we love you for that. Um, the, 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 the Italians want, would put them, um, the, 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 the Italians yeah. would argue they did, a, did, a, did the same. I mean, we, we were in Bologna in December, um, mm. probably um, I'm fully exposed to, to, Italian coronavirus, um, because of course yeah. it was in the north that it, that it hit, hit hardest, wasn't it? Um, and yeah. it, it was noticeable how many young people, again, 14 year old girls, sat outside cafes smoking like chimneys. Um, you just don't, you don't see that here. And also, what about the tradition of the passaggetta? You know, where, where, where in the evening the old folk listen, sit on their benches, and they watch people just kind of walking up and down and doing, hanging out and yeah. doing their stuff. Beautiful this thing. Is, this is, this, this is, this is, you know, the European Union wants to erase all that. They want to, they want to make everything hom homogenous. They wanted to make. I, I felt this very much when recently when all the blackface Morris dancing troops decided because of Black Lives Matter that they were no longer going to do blackface. Well, blackface was never a, never a racist thing. It was, it, it, it was a tradition that predates that kind of racist attitude. It was from something else. And the idea that because of political correctness, yet another piece of our culture dies just because a few offender trons want to be offended you know, or or in the same way, the RAF blanking over the over the the gravestone of of 
of Guy Gibson's dog, Nigger. Well, insane. No, I, I just, I can't imagine that any rational black, black person looking at the gravestone of a dog from 1944, or whatever it was, 42, 43, um, would be offended by it because it's everything is about context and about about meaning you know you can it's i i had this conversation with a with a with a i had a really shit time at cambridge um last time i went to cambridge and one of the few people who took my side was this was this black guy you know he he he, he got it totally and he looked after me when i was being harassed by these white sjw's so what what were the circumstances and, um, what were the circum- sorry? what were the circumstances Oh God, I I had to go and I was invited to be, I read about this in the Spectator when I still had my Spectator column, he said bitterly. Um, I was invited to talk to the uh, the annual Christmas dinner of the uh, the Cambridge Conservatives. And I gave this, I gave this speech and I, I was thinking on the way there in, in, in my car, I, I was driving up because I, I, I tend to write my speech to the last minute. I was thinking, what can I, how can I entertain them in this politically correct world when you can't say anything? And I said, and I, I was, I was describing, I wanted an analogy to describe how much the world had changed between the time I was at the university um, you know, when I was quite familiar with Cambridge as well as Oxford, because you know, the, we, I remember going up to the the varsity boxing match at Cambridge once. There was a sort of friendly rivalry between, you know, we used to call the Cambridge people tabs, um, can tabs, and dismissively, you know, like it's rubbish university, you know, sort of inferior to Oxford and so on. Anyway, I was thinking, y- you are you are a persecuted minority at Cambridge now. You have a really shit time. So let me give you a bit of a bit of a taste of the old values. And I, so I described a previous visit that I'd made to Cambridge um, where I had found in the bar about two or three or four conservative undergraduates who told me about how tough it was being a conservative at Cambridge. And they... The feeling I got was that that they were a bit like Catholics in the reign of Elizabeth or, or Protestants in the reign of Queen Mary. That they they you know they almost had to hide in their well, priest holes if they'd been Catholics. I suppose it, they, they would they were very persecuted and they were sort of cowering and they were sort of grateful to talk to somebody who who had their back for change and they sort of hung eagerly on my words. And I was trying to describe this, and I say, I was saying that it's um, the the difference in attitudes is a bit like if um, if Jimmy Savile and Rolf Harris had got into a time machine from a top of the pops in 1973, and and had come forward to the to the presence and uh, present and 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 realised that. Sleeping with underage girls was 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 no longer a uh, uh, you know <laughs> was surprised to find it was something like it was a, it was an analogy of that you know I mean you know I'm telling it now I don't I don't even think it was a particularly sort of sick analogy it's just a kind of an effective and true analogy mm-hmm. and at the mere mere invocation of the names of Jimmy Savile and and Rolf Harris and at the invocation of in a in a faintly jocular context of of sexual abuse or paedophilia or whatever that this was this was completely beyond the pale of acceptability it was so unfunny and people started walking out as i and and i'd just been warming up at this stage in my speech and once once people start walking out you, you you can never recover you can never you know it was a very unsatisfactory experience and i i didn't deliver the fun thing i wanted to deliver and the guy who'd invited me basically sort of completely fucked me over. He 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 didn't he didn't go. Oh, I'm really sorry, mate. You know, the, the few people here, you know, that they're, they're just reacted badly. Uh, he just he just 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 fucked off. Let, you know, I, I left me in my misery. But there was a there was a, an Irish Irish guy, um, black Irish guy, and I'm eternally grateful to him. And he, you know, he went with me to the pub, and he just said, "No, don't worry, mate. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right." Anyway, I was talking to him uh, on Passon about 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 uh, how everything is in context, and it, 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 I was not making light of 
of of paedophilia per se. I was I was making light of the change in cultural attitudes, and I said that in the same way, the word nigger can either be if, if voiced if voiced with contempt and hatred can be about the nastiest word in the language. At the same time, it can be an expression of great affection, like you know, if you say you're my nigger, you know, it means like you're my you're my brother, you're my you're my blood brother. Um, that was a very very long anecdote to come to the to, to the, the point, but yeah, I'm glad you asked me because I haven't told it properly before. So thank you. No, thank you for for, for sharing it. Um, yeah, the, humor humor is um, um, seemingly not allowed in this in this new new era, is it? Um, everything is no, and humor is very much about context. It's a very it, it's it's. Uh, It involves a level of intellectual sophistication, which which we all have within us, because we all would know how to get a joke. But nevertheless, it does it does involve an understanding of of nuance and levels, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah, um, this uh, shutting down of our of our traditions and of our cultural past in the name of political correctness is um, is, is is deeply worrying. Um, did you did you um, hear about the choir at Sheffield Cathedral? I did, and it, and it, it upset me so so much. It's horrendous. Um, it doesn't, just it doesn't just just tell us a bit more well, for for, for um, um, American and other listeners who don't know about this. What's happened? Yeah, well, in 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 a, in a nutshell, um, uh, Sheffield is a nord, northern city um, in in England. Um, it's beautiful, big old cathedral has. A long-standing choir, um, which has just been disbanded for not being um, diverse enough. And of course, by diverse, they they don't mean diversity of opinion. They mean um, um, not enough, too too white, basically is what is what they're saying, isn't it? Yeah. And um, they want an overrepresentation yeah. of um, of black and minority ethnic people everywhere in society. Um, an equal representation is not enough, of course. I mean that. Last week, it was revealed that there were four four hundred transgenders at um, the BBC. Um, I mean, what percentage? Four hundred. Four hundred employed by the BBC. Are you serious? Mm, four hundred. <gasps> what 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 um, percentage of the population identifies as transgender? Point one percent or something. I, I, I don't know, but it can't be much more than that. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, they've they've um, decided they want. They want more diversity in the in the choir, and until they get it, there there will be no choir in Sheffield. Um, Sheffield's a very poor city, a destitute city in many ways, um, and it doesn't have that much um, cultural um, um, amenities left. And getting rid of them like this is, is appalling. It really is. I mean, how many people are on the choir? Like twenty. Um, so how how can it be sufficiently diverse? How will they be able to achieve the diversity they want? The answer, I think, of course, is that, that, is that they'll never stop. It will never be diverse enough. The choir won't, um, the universities won't, uh, the BBC won't. It will never be diverse enough. There will always be no. something um, um, wrong. There will always be someone there who, who has to go. And it does seem to be always the same same people. I mean, it's mostly male um, um people of, of, of you know white skin color they want these people gone i mean i i try yes. not to buy into i mean I'm, I'm deeply suspicious of of things like you know kalergi plan and, and all this this sort of stuff because i do think there is a an anti-semitic streak in in a lot of that as we discussed earlier on um tell, tell me tell me about about the kalergi plan briefly because I've, I've 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 sort of seen it referred to and i'm not sure how how much it, into David Icke territory it is and how real it is. Um, I don't know that much about it. I just, there's a guy called Kugenhove, Kuvenhove Kalergi. Um, basically, that he, the conspiracy goes that, that um, the white race is being eradicated and that the European Union is, yeah. and the United Nations um, and all those, those, those entities are, um, are, are, are working towards the eradication of the white race. Um, I, I don't, I don't buy into that myself. Um, I think that there are other things, there are other ideologies driving those organisations. Um, 
you know, I, I don't think it's 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 that. But that, yeah, that's that, that's the clerky plan. Um, I I don't I don't buy into it. I think I'm, I'm put off by by it um, being adjacent to to a lot of of um, actual Nazis um, who who are out there. You know, um, I mean, I don't think there was I yes. don't think there was common as a as as uh, the average Guardian columnist would would have you believe, but um, these people do exist, um, and they are deeply unpleasant, obviously. Although I think we can we can push this this kind of this thing too far. This 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 about if if people who might be described as hard right think about worry about something, therefore it cannot be real or true. I do, I just just a, a slight digression. I was looking at a, a, a Twitter exchange um, yesterday or the day before between um, one of the guys from Trigonometry, Constantin, you know, the... Yeah, Constantin Kissin. Constantin Kissin, yeah. And it's weird. I, I'm, I'm slightly puzzled by why they haven't had me on the show yet because, I mean, originally when they started out, they, they invited me on and I said, yeah. And but they've they've been very sort of backward about having me on 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 recently. They haven't pushed it, and they keep sort of making excuses why not. And yesterday, somebody was asking why they hadn't have or why they wouldn't have Tommy Robinson on the show, and he was like, you know, well, we don't want to be cancelled, and Tommy Robinson is blah blah blah. And I was thinking, well, um, Tommy Robinson is not. I mean, I know him reasonably well. I mean, he's got his flaws. You know, he's handy with his fists. Uh, he's he, he's sometimes rash, and, and and he quite likes a bit of confrontation. But when you talk to him, I I don't get the impression that he's fits into any definition of racist or you know he's he doesn't hate Muslims per se. I mean, he's suspicious about the religion, which I think is is reasonable. Um, but this thing that people have of, of trying to distance themselves from anything which might enable the left to tar them as hard right. Mind you, the bar is so bloody low this way, these days. I mean, I've never been called hard right or far right before until, until the last five years, because I'm not, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I believe in limited government and freedom and, and I like, I get on with black people and Jews and, you know, I've got, I've got my Muslim special friend. He writes to me, you know, dear James, it's your Muslim special friend here. I mean, I, I don't think that if I were, if I were really racist or Islamophobic, I'd have Muslims writing to me saying, I'm your Muslim special friend. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's extraordinary how, to have even this conversation, I imagine there's going to be leftists if they listen to it who'd think, "Yeah, these these are a pair of evil fascists." Sure. Um, Why? What have we? It's, what happened? It's um, um, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, as as it as it happens, I I place fascism on the left. I don't think. Yeah. I, oh, so do I. So um, do I. I, don't, I. I I I don't um um I don't accept that. The further right you go, um, you know, the, the the more like Hitler you become. I, I think that's a, that's absurd. And in, in actual fact, um, in actual fact, they both both fascists and and com- communists look to um, utopia um, um, for, for guidance, which is a Thomas Thomas More's utopia is a left left wing um, vision. Um, this idea that you can you can perfect mankind is is not a right wing um, view at all. Right wing people see that um, human beings are inherently flawed, imperfectible, um, and that you just have to to um, learn to live with that. And that's obviously what limited government's about, isn't it? Um, you can't you can't have it is well. well the, the, that's that's the the definition that Hayek preferred was was collectivist, and he he defined you know he said look, communists and Nazis are both collectivist ideologies, and he made very little distinction between the two, having seen both in action when he wrote that book in 1944. Yeah, yeah, he wrote, wrote, wrote a serfdom, yeah. wasn't it? Um, have you read Liberal Fascism by, by Jonah Goldberg? Yeah, I have, I have. And 
I'm a great admirer of that book when he points out also that, that America experienced liberal fascism very much under Woodrow Wilson. I mean, when you look at, look at what America was like during the first, first World War, it was fascistic. There's no question about it. And, and I hardly think that FDR's confiscation of gold was, was not a pretty fascistic measure, not the sort of thing you'd associate with the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. So yeah, I mean, we're. I, I I do worry that that what's happening to our world now is something that you and I, growing up, never imagined would happen. This was, this was, the totalitarianism we're experiencing now was something that happened behind the Iron Curtain, and in South American banana republics, and in African countries run by dictators, and in communist country but no not in the west no way yeah it was unimaginable um i as a as a boy uh I remember hearing the word nazi and and words nazi and fascist in relation to to um mussolini and hitler and um neo-nazi um, in relation to sort of skinheads beating up Jews and gays in the streets and so on, um, these words yeah. really meant something. They were they were powerful words, like racist. If you call someone a racist, it, it meant something. That was a that was a heavy, um, um, hard hitting word. And now now these 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 um, things just they've been rendered they've rendered been rendered meaningless. Um, and we have all around us speech codes. Based based um, upon the notion that that these these are problems um, all over, Britain is not a racist country. I don't believe that Britain is a racist country. I've, I actually I, I find Black Lives Matter deeply offensive. Um, you know, I find yeah. it for, for a whole host of different reasons, but um, that 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 perhaps above all, um, it's not a racist country. We're not racist people. We're extremely tolerant. Um, all the um, um, best data on the subject shows that we're far more tolerant than our neighbours on the continent, um, and I don't think that continentals are um, terribly racist people either. Um, yeah, it's 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 very very strange. I could never have imagined it. Um, the the, the, spe the no. speech codes, the speech codes especially, are um, are extraordinary. I could never have predicted. It. They are extraordinary. They're, no, you're right. They've they pathologised normal behavior for example when i when i get talking to somebody with a different color or a different accent or whatever one of the first things i want to know is about where they're from you know what what their what their background is because i think getting to know somebody is about getting a feel for who they are and where they're coming from that's a microaggression now, isn't it? microaggressions it's, 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 so being polite and being interested being curious is a microaggression. Yeah. It's it's so. Oh. I would consider it rude not to ask somebody about yeah. where they're from, and because you you can have good conversations. I mean, I love yeah. I love talking to Pakistani taxi drivers about what's going on in Pakistan. You know, and getting a you know, you, it's how you find out about the world, isn't it? Yeah. It's so strange. Um, it's like they want to make us into uh, in, in, incurious meat robots, um, which you know is, 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 meat is, robots is, like is, yeah. is hor horrifying. You know, sort of Marx, Marxist Leninist sausage factory, um, churning out these these meat robots. Um, I I don't want to live in a country like that. I don't want to live in a country where um, everyone is the same. You know, you mentioned earlier the the European Union's desire to. Um, uh, extinguish the ancient um, evolved nation states of, of Europe, Italy and, Fran and France and Greece yeah. and all these different countries, and to have one uni universal European. I mean, European is meaningless, isn't it, really? Um, there's no such thing as a European as such. I mean, it's a geographic term, I suppose. But, God, no. but I mean, how different are Germans and Greeks? Um, how wonderfully different are Germans uh, and Greeks just, and just French bit, and yeah. Italians and, you know... Um, I, I, I like that. I like those differences. Um, those, are, those are fascinating countries with, with, with fascinating histories. It is, it is about Germany, though, isn't it? It's about um, Germany getting rid of, of, of you know, Hitler from its, from, its, from its past. Yes. 
Yes. And that's what's, what's driving yes. it. What do you think is driving it here in Britain? Oh, um, it's a, it's a combination of things. I mean, it's a, a function partly, I think, of the dumbing down of our education system. Um, well, it seems a bit too pat to talk about um, Gramsci and I think it was really Dutchka, wasn't it? Who came up with the phrase, the long march through the institutions, not Gramsci, but Gramsci sort of formulated the idea. Um, but I think that there is no question that our entire, I keep thinking about these book ideas, which I've then failed to write because I, you know, I haven't got the time or the inclination and stuff. But one of the books I wanted to write was about, was called something like Paradise, uh, Parasite Wasps. Um, and I was thinking of the wasps that lay their eggs inside the um, the spider. And then the, 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 the eggs, as they, they hatch, they eat them their way through the body of the spider and they feast on its on its living body and they emerge. And I think something similar has happened to all our cultural institutions. I mean, it's obvious that the universities have fallen. There is, there is no diversity of thought in our universities anymore. And even, you know, I was at university in the uh, 80s and there were definitely, I don't think I was taught by any of them, but there were definitely Dons there who were of the who were conservatives rather than Labour. I think all my Dons were probably left, but they never showed their left left wingery. It was all about the literature. It wasn't about the politics. Oh, I had a Marxist. I had a I had a feminist Marxist called Penny Boomler, and Penny Boomler took me for George Eliot, and I was terrified when I heard that I was going to get a feminist Marxist. Um, but when she marked my essays, she didn't mark me down for not being a feminist Marxist. She was she was great. And it, uh, I think back then it was okay. And now they're all they're all hard left and they and, and I think they're they're shameless about showing it. But it's not just the schools and the universities, it's institutions like the law firms. Even even sort of crusty chambers are now are now recruiting people for their because they're women or because they're black or or or, or both rather than because they're the best person for the job. Um, look at the army. Even the army has been um, SJW converged. Look at the adverts they produce now. Look at the, look at the, look at the firemen. Firemen don't exist anymore. They're now, they're, what are they called? Firefighters. And when I drive past, there's, there's a, I, I drive to, through a, part, a place called Long Buckby. Um, and I look at the billboard outside the fire station and the recruitment drives aimed at women and aimed at, aimed at minorities. And you're thinking, well, okay, there aren't many minorities around that, but, you know, it's rural Northamptonshire, number one. But women, why do you want women in, 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 as, as firemen? They're, they're called firemen for a reason. You want, you want a chap carrying out of a burning building. You don't want some some girl. And as, a, as an old fashioned man, I don't really want women being put in the way of danger in the same way I don't really want women as infantry. I'm not saying that there are no women who could make good infantry. You, you, you see it in those Kurdish units, which are all women and you see it in the IDF to a degree. But I think as the Israeli defense forces have shown in, in, in countless experiments, women and men, uh, you know, mixed combat infantry units don't work because when the woman gets hit, the men's instinct is to go and rescue the women rather than pressing on to take the position, which is what you should do. Um, otherwise you all get wiped out. Just a couple of examples of the way that our whole culture has been a, a really a minority of people on the left, but their determined people have turn the institutions from their ostensible purpose. You know, the army is about defense of the realm. Uh, law is about the application of the law in, 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 you know, according to English common law and so on. They've changed. It's now about things like diversity and uh, equity. Correctness. 
equity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's one of the, that's almost the most dangerous idea of the age, the idea that equality is something that we should, we should try and create. It's, equality is not a very good goal. No, um, uh, it's an extremely dangerous goal um, to to um, pursue. And a lot of people are, are, are aware that um, equality of outcome is, a lot of people on the right are, are aware that equality of outcome is um, unachievable and, and that it is um, dangerous to pursue it. But I actually think that a, a, a quality of opportunity um, um, is also equally um, um, difficult to, to uh, impossible to to achieve, and um, and dangerous to go after. And because I mean, how how would you have a society where everybody has a quality of opportunity? It just it's, it, it, you know it, it it wouldn't be wouldn't be feasible, would it? How would you bring about a society it- like that? It, it, it wouldn't be achievable and it's wrong. You know, you don't want, I mean, people who join the army, you you want people who want to kill, yeah. basically. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the idea that, that, that Scott. the army is about, I don't know, about about boosting your self-esteem or whatever. I mean, these are, these are, these are adjunct things that may, adjunct benefits that, and, and I think that they are, they are true. I think we know that that well Wellington called his soldiers the scum of the earth and we know that the army has traditionally recruited men from backgrounds where if they hadn't joined the army they'd have ended up in prison or they'd have been ended up in you know drunk and living on the street and the army has given them a sense of purpose it's given them given them discipline it's made made real men of them and productive men i mean heroes they people they're they're laying on their lives on the line for us and and that's great i can't remember how i got to this what was i saying at the beginning um talk, talk, talking about the um the, the, the kind of um, hollowing out of our institutions or more so oh yes that's the, right well my parasite wasp parasite wasp you know um yeah. By the way, it's really nice talking to you, Renan, because I sometimes, you know, when, when I'm when I've got somebody like David Starkey or Douglas Murray or, or somebody, I, I always feel slightly like it's it's more like an interview. The certain the certain buttons I've got to push to get them, and actually, Starkey was really tricky. Really? Um, I it didn't help when I interviewed him. I didn't know it at the time. I had coronavirus. <laughs> And I was, I thought I had a, had a nasty cold, but I booked it, you know, it was quite hard to get in advance. Anyway. Um, did I you do it face to face? Coronavirus. Sorry? Did you do it in person? Oh, you did? I, saw, yeah, I, saw, yeah. I actually saw it. You, 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 two of you sat, yeah, I, 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 I saw the interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I was feeling, I was feeling really rotten. Um, and, um, and, and, and you're conscious with, with, with Starkey that there is an interview you want to get out of him. You want him to be, you want to be him to be at his most starkish, um, forthright and stuff. And actually, interesting. I, 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 I corresponded with him, and 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 he 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 um said something about that he didn't think I'd been on on uh, done a very good interview or something, which I thought was rather rude with him. Uh, I, I I rather felt that actually he was being deliberately perverse. That he was you know he was he was playing hard to get and, and was. Rather than giving me the stuff I wanted, he was he was being, uh, yeah. I used to be a libertarian, and now I'm kind of a bit of a kind of liberal squish. <laughs> he gave he gave his hardcore interview to Darren Grimes instead, with with consequences, which is what what yeah. what are your thought your yeah. thoughts on on that episode? We'll come, I've I've made a note. Parasite wasps, by the way. I want to get you to continue with that in a minute. Oh, yeah, well, well, yeah, well, yeah, we'll come back to that point. I I I, I feel no, I think. Starkey is a a brilliant man. I think he is one of our best historians. I think he is very brave. Uh, he's one of the very few people with the balls to go out there and articulate ideas that actually ought to be commonplace. It's just sensible conservative ideas. I don't think he's racist. I don't think he's a bad person. I I think he's probably a creature of his a, a product of his generation. So he might have 
slightly different cultural attitudes to somebody who's kind of been brought up in the world of woke. But beyond that, I don't, he's certainly not a racist. I think his, his only mistake in, in that, he shouldn't have apologized afterwards. I mean, he, you know, they, they completely fucked him up the ass on the other side with a, with a, a ginormous pointed dildo with poison tipped. Uh, and he lost everything. And I think it's just, it's, 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 it's illustrative of just how much the, the red guard cultural revolution madness has gone that he can be destroyed. Look, we're doing a podcast now at any point in this conversation, I could say something which was just the, uh, the work of a fleeting moment, the product of a thought that came into my head that I might have, had I, had I, you know, different circumstances, I might have voiced it in an entirely different way. And yet for that, it would be possible if interpreted in, the, in an aggressive way to destroy my whole career on the, well, it would do if I had a career to destroy it. And I do particularly, you know, I, I'm not reliant on a publisher. I haven't got a publisher. I work for Breitbart. Breitbart is probably not going to sack me for for being for being right wing. Uh, I haven't got a slot on the BBC. I'm not a, attached to an Oxbridge College or anything like that. I haven't got a literary agent, or I, I've got I've got one, but it, I haven't written a book for her yet. So, um, but but how easy it is in these times for somebody to be cancelled. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a sort of there's a sort of thing you're meant to say about how, oh, he expressed himself clumsily. But I mean, who doesn't express themselves clumsily occasionally? Uh, that's the nature of conversations. They're not, they're they're not pre-prepared speeches. They are, <laughs> they're whatever whatever makes our thoughts work in that in that particular moment. So I think, poor guy. I think it's appalling what's happened to him. Tell me, tell me what, what what's your take on it? Um, I'm ho- horrified. Uh, Starkey is a, um, a a great um, man. He's a he's a heavyweight um, thinker. He's a um, brilliant writer. He's a great personality, a great character. Um, he's someone who um, and brings enormous amounts of wealth a wealth of knowledge to to um, the conversation. He's um, um, he doesn't deserve to have been treated as, as, as he as he has been. It's disgusting. I I wonder if Darren Grimes should have um, um, edited that. To be honest with you, um, if look, this is how I look at it, okay, it's a bit like yeah. you know Sam Harris does the same thing. I believe I don't mean to compare myself to Sam Harris. Um, I just mean that I I, I um, have the same approach as him to doing things like what we're doing now, and that is um, that. If you say anything um, which might, you know, which came, if something comes out wrong, it comes out clum, um, clumsily, it might get you, you know, in trouble. It's maybe it's something that you said that you didn't mean, um, you know, because we're thinking aloud sometimes, aren't we? That yeah. um, he's happy to, yeah. to edit it out or have you say it again. That that for me is 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 how this sort of thing should be approached, especially in this um, time when these um, um, woke fascists are running around cancelling people. I hate that word, cancel. It's all totalitarian. Yeah. Um, it, it, it belongs in, in Ceausescu's Romania or something. It doesn't belong in a free country. Um, yeah, I, I think what, what happened to Starkey was, was appalling. But the mistake he, he made was apologising. He never apologised, ever. Never, ever. Ever apologize. This is what Vox Day says, and Vox Day is right. Never apologize. They just want. They just see that as a, as a, an invitation to go in harder. Yeah, yeah. They, that's um, weak. That's weak. And it's always, it's always what I'm telling my dear friend Toby. Uh, to, I, I mean, the transformation of Toby is one of the things that's given me great pleasure in the last two or three years. Toby is so much less of a cuck than he was. Uh, he should never have apologised or, or shown any contrition because he he'd done nothing wrong. Um, and I, th- in fact, this is an interesting point. I, 
I always digress in these things, but maybe that's 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 for the best. Um, uh, and especially when you're on <laughs> on drugs like I am. Um, what was I thinking of here? Um, oh no, it's gone. It, it, it will come back to me. It will come back to me. Um, Can we, 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 going we, back to what we was. We went, well, let's go, we let's go back to the talk about the about the army um, and about yeah. uh, about parasite wasps. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is that? I think this is so important, and I and although I mentioned it before, I I I can't mention it often enough. That there there is not enough thinking from first principles in our culture. Yeah. You know, we we the the left. The left loves to caricature the position of people like you and me as being one of uncaring. We, we, we have the view that we do because we don't, we just don't give a shit about other people. And I, you know, I'd be having this on Twitter today about, you know, when I, when I, I posed with a, posed in Waitrose and Aldi, not wearing the, the, a mask. The, I read, I read so, some of those tweets to you. Sorry, sorry to, to, to stop you there for a second, James. I read some of those some of those tweets directed at you um, online today, regarding the the masks yeah. are absolutely vile. Um, you know they're they're the, 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 the really tolerant people, of course. You know, they like to tell everyone how yeah. tolerant they are. Um, level the most most um, obnoxious, mean spirited um, um, abuse at people. It's, it's just horrible. You know, it really is. Sorry. So, so yeah, they, 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 they want to dehumanise you, and that, and that, of course, is what the Nazis did to the Jews. And I, I don't think it, it's that the, the reducto ad Hitleram is a is a is a kind of sign that you lost the debate. It's just it's just factually accurate that totalitarians love to to dehumanise their enemies in order to make their eradication seem somehow like no worse than eradicating any other form of vermin and that's and that's how they roll and that's what we're heading towards but first principles what is it that we want about this world we live in well one of the first things we want to do is we we all want to get along Uh, that seems to be a basic a basic and so how can we foster a world when we all get along while at the same time a world that functions economically which enables people to um, you know, enjoy the fruits of their labor. If they work hard, they should benefit from it. Um, how do we ensure? Yeah, you know, it's it that that business you mentioned about equality of opportunity. Uh, I agree with you. It's become a bit of a cliche. It's a bit of a kind of lazy cop out for conservatives to say, uh, "I don't believe in equality of outcome, but I do believe in equality of opportunity." But I share your skepticism that that's really popular, uh, really really possible. I mean, I mean, where do you stop? Is it is it unfair that I can't play for Chelsea uh, despite my inability to play football? Well, no, I don't think it is really. Equally, is it unfair that uh, a, a an Islamist girl in full hijab can't work in a hairdresser? Well, no, I don't think it is. I think she's she's made her bed; she's got to lie in it. You know, if, if her religion is that important to her, then you can't get. There's lots of oh, cat there, but lots of jobs that you can't be able to do. So, so equality of opportunity is actually a, a, a complete chimera. Um, but if we thought, according, if everyone thought according to, 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 to first principles, the world would be a lot, uh, would be a lot less hatred and violence in the world. I think. And, and, and people would think a lot more clearly. Most people can't, can't think clearly. I mean, for example, imagine if you, pl- you, oh my God, Ronan, what I've been told is that I've got to, I've got to go swimming now. And I do have to go swimming, not, not just because for recreational purposes, but because my arm is so fucked that I need, I'll go, well, you give me two minutes and I'll be there. Should, we'll, we'll have to, what are we gonna do? Should we continue this? podcast some other time or or should we just just say well we'll do one soon um it's look it's it's it's, it's up to you um I'm, I'm enjoying the cat i'm enjoying the conversation i'd like to continue um but you know uh when whenever why don't what, what we do you know? think is best let's 
I think what we should do is just do this one and and then put a, another one soon. We can have another, you know, we might wear different different colored shirts or yeah. something. If you can remember where we are. Yeah, I tell you, we'll, we'll start with well, first principles. We, this, this has been good. I've really enjoyed this. And uh, we must have done about an hour, haven't we? We've done an hour and 45 minutes. Have we really? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! It felt like it felt like like no more than an hour. That's really good. So I think we'll we'll make this one self-contained, and then we'll do another one soon because it's yeah. been really good talking to you. So you're listening to the Delling, the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Paul, and my special guest Ronan. I, I still forget how to pronounce your name. R- Ronan Mayer. Ronan Mayer. Ronan Mayer. Mayor, Ronan, it's been really good to, uh, and uh, I'd like to meet you in person one day. It's been fantastic. Like, likewise, James. It was really, it was, it was a real pleasure. Re- really, in, really enjoyable. So thanks a lot. And oh, and, and oh, listeners, don't forget um, to support me on Patreon or subscribe star, and you get early access to this this stuff. And um, you support me and enable me to have my expensive back treatment among other things. Um, and thank you, Ronan Mayer. That's been, it's been really fun. Um, thank, thank you. Let's do another one soon. Okay, great. Hi, James.